blow there. So hand saws for woodworking. What do I need in hand saws? Before we get into my recommendations of what you need, you need to understand that this is one of the most opinionated subjects in hand tool woodworking. Almost everything in hand tool woodworking is full of opinion, but saws are really, really controversial to some subgroups in the woodworking community. Um, and everybody has their own idea of what constitutes a particular kind of saw, uh, what kind of saws you need, uh, what a saw is called, um, what kind of cutting tooth pattern you need, um, yada yada yada, even down to what shape the handle should be. Okay, and a lot of it is, most of it is informed by that person's methodology, the way that he or she works the wood or the way in which he or she uses the saw. And so, for me, there are three main saws that you need to have as a woodworker. Um, others would say you might be able to get away with two, and then you might see another guy that says you need five, six, eight saws. They all have different names and all of that, but there are three different categories that you need in woodworking in order to work wood with hand tools. And there are two different patterns to the teeth that you need. So everything else comes down to how the saw is used or the preference of the person using that saw. For me, I believe that you need at least three saws. And there are variations within those three types of saws. The first category of saws is known as a panel saw. Now this is also known as a hand saw. All of these saws, everybody thinks, well, a saw that is used with the hand is a hand saw, and that's incorrect. Uh, this is a category of saws known as panel saws, and it, the reason it's called a panel saw is because it's a, a reasonably thick panel of steel and that's where the strength of the plate comes in so that it doesn't buckle and bend and stuff like that when you saw wood with it. So this is a panel saw but now this saw is also a hand saw. And what I mean by that, most hand tool woodworkers will tell you that a saw that is 20, a hand saw, a panel saw, that is, has a blade from the heel to the toe, that is 26 inches, is known as a hand saw, and anything under that is a panel saw. Now, I have two types of panel saw. This is the second type of panel saw that I have, and it is, I think this is a 24 inch blade. Now, there are some that say that 24 inches is the cutoff for a, a hand saw, and anything under that is considered a panel saw. I don't call either one of them panels or hand saws, or both panel saws, but I might call these hand saws, and I also might call what else is on the table hand saws, because I don't get caught up in a bunch of the minutia, it's a pain in the rear end and it doesn't serve my woodworking. All it does is tend to confuse people that are watching. 
so your mileage may vary. But now the first saw that I think you need is a hand saw or panel saw that's 24 inches or better in a rip cut pattern. Okay, that has a decent number or, or a, a decent size tooth line. This saw has eight teeth or eight points rather per inch of saw play, which means eight of these teeth will fit within an inch. So it's a good compromise between a fine and a coarse cut. Um, a lot of the rip hand saws will be four and a half, five PPI or TPI. Okay, and it's this kind of saw is meant to rip wood down. If I have a large panel of wood, a piece of wood that's nice and wide, and I want to cut that down in width and size it for a project this is the saw that I would use that's what this saw is for it's to prep your wood to size so that you can use it now the other panel saw that I have here or hand saw that I have here is a 10 TPI or PPI there's like the way that they're measured makes a difference. PPI is one less, I think, or one more tooth because of the way that it's measured. So if it's a, like a seven TPI, it's a eight PPI or whatever. So seven teeth per inch, eight points per inch, yada, yada, yada. Like I said, too much minutia does nobody any good, okay? It's a bit fine. This is a 10 PPI. It's a bit finer cut, but this is a cross cut pattern. So I want to explain to you the difference between the two so that you understand. But this rip cut saw is meant to cut to rip wood with the grain, either in this direction or in di that direction. But when you're going down the length of the panel with the grain, it's a rip cut. This saw is a cross cut, and it means that if I cross the grain, either in this direction or this direction, that's what these the teeth on these saw are designed to do. Now, if you get like a 10 PPI saw like this and file it for rip, there's a lot of people that will tell you you can use this for uh, cross cut and rip. Maybe you can. But I still think cross cut and rip cut are essential in these size saws, in these two sizes, and I'll show you why. First, let's address rip cut teeth. A rip cut tooth is shaped like a chisel. It has a flat cross section and a bevel that comes to an edge. And it's made, if I were to take this chisel and cut along the grain, you see that essentially that's giving me a fairly smooth cut, right? Because it's ripping the teeth out with the grain. But if I was to take this same tooth pattern you see how it's ripping out fibers here. That's because if I'm coming along this way, I'm going with the grain. And it's easy to, do, to dig out between those fibers in the grain with a chisel point. 
But if I take that same chisel point and try to go across the grain, I get bad results. So with a rip cut pattern, you have bigger teeth and you have a chisel, a row of teeth with chisel points. And they're going along the grain and ripping down the grain, okay? If you were try to try to do that with a crosscut saw, the teeth are a bit finer and the teeth are filed a different way. And it'll be slow to do that. It'll do it, but it's slow. And this is why you don't want to buy a saw from Lowe's or Home Depot or any other place that sells big box type tools. You have to understand that nowadays places like Home Depot or Harbor Freight or Lowe's or Menards or name whatever the hardware stores or uh, True Value whatever okay they're aimed at modern carpentry and what that is is um, Guys that are building houses, they're framing houses and building uh, roofing and uh, rafters and finished work and stuff like that. And they're, they're not doing rip cuts. They're, if they use a handsaw at all, it's to cut a 2 by 4 across the grain. So you'll find these saws and they'll say, well, they have a hybrid cut. A hybrid cut and what they're saying is that it will rip as well as cross cut but in actuality that hybrid cut is nothing more than a compromised cross cut pattern in the saw teeth because they know that the majority of work with a handsaw is going to be done across the grain and more likely than not the guy's going to pick up a circular saw and set the piece of wood on a couple of saw horses and go Wee! and be done. He's not really considering these. He's not concerned about these. So vintage saws or saws that are made specifically for hand tool woodworking, they're going to cost more. The modern variations. And the thing of it is, another thing about the hardware store stuff is that the plate is not hardened. Just the teeth are on the majority of them. So their teeth are so hard, they're hardened really, really super hard, so that the saw will last two or three years before it gets so dull you gotta throw it away in a landfill. Because it's disposable, you can't sharpen it. The teeth are too hard, the files will not, it's there, the teeth are as hard or harder than the file itself and the file cannot cut it. So that saw will last you two or three years, five at the outside and you're gonna toss it and buy another one. It's another reason I don't like the Japanese saws besides the pull stroke, which I don't like. They're fine saws, they cut really well, okay? But you can't resharpen them. Resharpen them, you have to throw them away, throw the blade away and replace the blade, okay? Um, in Japan, there are some high-end craftsmen that make Japanese saws that can be resharpened, but you're not going to do it. You're going to send it to Japan, or if you live in Japan, if you acquire those saws, you're going to send them to Japan to be sharpened by a professional that knows exactly what he or she is doing. Or if, if, if you're in Japan, you're going to send it to that guy and have him sharpen it because they're not possible to be sharpened without a lot of know-how because the teeth are so fine. That's, that's another point. With the Western saws that I'm showing you here, you really don't want to go uh, more teeth than like 16 PPI. Somewhere between 12 and 14 is almost the max, although 16 will work. But after that, like a 20 tooth or, or, or 22 tooth, the teeth are so small you can't sharpen them by hand. 
So you want to stay between like 12 and 16 teeth per inch on any kind of saw that you need finer teeth for. And then of course the, the lower count teeth, bigger teeth or rip saws or more coarsely uh, designed crosscut saws, that kind of deal. So let's uh, look at the crosscut for a little bit and explain what it is. Now I showed you that example and I showed you how this cuts along the grain very well. And I showed you how this cuts horribly along the, across the grain because of the tooth pattern. Well, this saw is a crosscut saw. These teeth are sharpened differently. They're sharpened with a knife edge and they're sharpened when you look at a saw, say this is the tooth line, the, the top of my teeth, my, the top of my fingers, the tips of my fingers are the tooth line on that saw. These are the teeth. On a saw, a saw has something called set. And what that is, is the teeth have to be a little bit wider than this plate. Because if they're not, this plate will get bound up in the cut, the walls of the cut. Now, a lot of traditional vintage saws have what's known as a taper grind, which means the plate is ground thinner here and thicker here and thicker here and thinner here. So that it kind of makes room for that plate. But there's also a way that the teeth are offset. It's called saw set. And if the teeth were lined up like this, what would happen is these are individual teeth. The teeth would be set like this. In other words, this tooth would go that way and this tooth would go this way and this one that way and this one this way and this one and this one you get the picture so they're offset in an alternating pattern to make this just a little bit wider than this so the saw cuts smoothly now saw set is something that's very particular to the guy that uses the saw but in general you want as little set as you need for the saw to work smoothly but now with the rip cut, all of these teeth, whether they're over here or over here, are uh, sharpened like a chisel. It would be like a chisel that the bevel uh, was facing you, okay? Or the back, actually, was facing you. A, a crosscut saw, this tooth, has a knife to edge filed on it on this side and this tooth has a knife edge filed on it on this side so that as I cut the path of the blade on either side the saw plate the path of the saw cut the teeth on either side are knife edges one right after the other alternately so that it cuts a knife wall along both sides of the cut that the saw makes and severs the fibers across the grain so that you don't get this and it makes a clean cut. That's the difference between the two and in my opinion you need a rip cut panel saw and a cross cut panel saw to size all of your wood to a close size for starting your projects. So these two saws you need. So let's put them to the side. That's the one kind of saw that you need. The first kind. The second kind of saw that you need is a back saw. They're called back saws 
This is a category of saws. There are several different types. Depending on the tooth count, the way the teeth are filed, the amount of set that's in it, uh, the thickness of the, the height of the plate, the length of the plate, that kind of deal, okay? And what you're going to do with the saw. Now this one needs to be restored, okay? But I have another one that I put a handle that came off a different kind of saw on it to, to use it. Okay. I chose this one because it has the type of handle that goes on this type of saw. But this is known as a back saw. And what it is, is it's a relatively thin plate. Thinner than something like that. Panel saw. And what keeps it from twist, from bending and... Uh, let's let the helicopter go. This is known as a back saw. It has a thinner plate than a panel saw does. And what keeps it from bending and kinking in the cut is it has a spine along the back that stiffens the blade to keep it straight. Okay? This is a these are in a category a subcategory, the category of this is a back saw. This is a second type of saw you need. But these are in a category known as joinery saws. Some people would call this a, a tenon saw or a carcass saw or a, a sash saw. Depending on how they viewed it, what they were doing with it and how it's made or what the, the height of the uh, saw plate is, how the uh, teeth are filed, yada yada yada, how long it is, that kind of deal. Okay. This is the main saw that you will use in projects. Okay. You'll cut everything down with these big saws, but once you get things to the size that you want to, most of the cuts that you will make will be made with this saw. Now, what about things like tenon, carcass, sash? Well, they're kind of different depending on what you're doing with them. But, for instance, a tenon saw. There are people that will argue with you that a tenon saw ought to be a cross-cut saw because to cut the cheeks of the tenon, in other words, if I cut a tenon in this, I would cut across here and across here, and then I would cut down like this to make a tenon that goes into a mortise to join two pieces of wood together, okay? Uh, they would argue that a tenon saw should be cross-cut because you're cutting these cheeks. The problem with that is that's the only cross-cut you're going to make, okay, is around the perimeter of that tenon. Cutting this way and this way, which is what you're going to do to cut the tenon part, of a tenon are all rip cuts. So the majority of people would call a saw like this in a rip pattern a tenon saw. Okay. And tenon saws can be this size, which is a general purpose size, or if you're building big huge cabinets and stuff like that, you might up end up with a big huge tenon saw that's got a deeper cut, okay? Still a back saw, still a joinery saw, but some people would call this in a rip pattern a tenon saw. Now if I took this and cut it and sharpen it for a cross cut, they might call it a carcass or a sash saw because it makes cuts that are used to make the carcass of whatever project you're making 
or it makes cuts. Actually, the sash saw would be shorter, not as tall, and it might it would be fairly long, but it would resemble more of this saw. But it would be in a cross-cut pattern, and uh, that goes back to when they cut window sashes. They would cut them to length across the grain. Okay, so all of these things they're how the person views the saw. Okay, and they'll sharpen that saw and choose the the length and the height and and uh, things of that nature by what they're going to use the saw for and they'll call it whatever they want to call it. Okay. A lot of times builders will have two saws like this, one of them in a cross cut and one of them in a rip cut. When you start looking at teeth that are this small, these are probably 12 or 14, I would guess that's a 14 points per inch or 14 teeth per inch. Okay. If I file this rip and give it a minimal set, it will cross cut really, really clean because the teeth are not very big and the set is not very wide. And so I really, in my opinion, I don't need a cross cut pattern one of these saws. All of these saws with a fine teeth, 12 teeth per inch or or more, I can uh, sharpen in a rip cut pattern and they will work either way. Okay. So, what about a dove saw or a dovetail saw? Okay, well, a dovetail saw is a back saw, it's a joinery saw. What it is, is it's a specialty saw. It's generally filed rip because you're cutting dovetails. down the grain. You're ripping. You're doing a rip cut. It's got 14 to 16 teeth per inch. Most of the time it's a short plate that's about an inch and three quarters tall. Uh, about, you'll get about about two inches tall including the spine and you'll get like an inch and three quarter cut. Depth of cut. Because on a dovetail, you're not cutting a two or three inch deep long dovetail. You're not joining two or three inch thick pieces of wood together in a dovetail, usually. But, do I need a dovetail saw if I have one of these? Probably not. Okay, and this is where it gets into opinion. This will cut dovetails just fine. It's taller, it's a bit heavier. The thing with the dovetail saw, the, the plate is shorter and it's a lighter saw comparably. And it's probably a thinner plate than what this is. So that you get a really, really super fine cut. Okay. It has a very minimal set, but, but honestly, all of my saws has have the minimum set I can put them put on them to make them function properly because the more sets you have on, in a set of teeth, the longer it takes to cut with it, and the more the saw is going to try to move in that cut. So I, I want that saw to track straight and true. I want it to cut as fast as it possibly can, and I want it to cut cleanly with a lot of, not a lot of busted out stuff on the back side of the cut. So I'm going to use the sharpest teeth I can get, the smallest teeth for the job that I'm doing, and the most minimum of set I can get away with. Alright? But I can cut down with tails with this just fine. Now, like I said, for bigger work, I might choose a bigger saw depends. This saw needs to be restored. I need to repair the handle on it and things like that. But honestly, 
I'm not building a big set of chest of drawers or, or a bed side or a, a bedroom dresser or, or big huge cabinets or anything like that right now. And I really don't need to saw right now, so I haven't messed with it. But there are people that will say, you must have a dovetail saw. There are people that will say, you must have one of these in a rip cut and a cross cut. There are people that will say, you need one of these in a rip cut and a cross cut. It depends on how they work. For me, one of this type and size of saw in a good, in like 14 PPI and a rip pattern tooth with a minimal set on it, will do everything I need to do short of anything huge that I need something like this for, okay? Um, and so, actually, what I'm probably going to do is when I restore this saw, I'm going to set it up the way I described with uh, a rip cut and a fine set. And then I'm going to take the other saw that I have like this, make a handle just like this for it, cut the plate down to two inches and make me a dedicated dovetail saw just because I want one. Not because I need one. This will do it. The other saw will do it just fine without having to do anything that I just said to it. But just so I can have a dedicated dovetail saw, I'm probably going to at some point do that. But this is pretty much the most used saw you will use is a joinery back saw right around this size. The third type of saw that you need, you won't need this starting out unless you're doing uh, curvy stuff starting out. Most of the time you're doing straight cuts starting out. But you need, this is a coping saw. It's in a category called frame saw meaning it's a very small blade that's suspended between two points and it has a frame on it that makes the saw blade stiff. Now you can get a whole lot of different varieties and there are even frame saws that have big old uh, saw blades like that with like one or two teeth per inch to rip big huge boards and to rip logs and stuff like that down but generally unless you are dealing with stuff like that you really don't need them but a coping saw you're going to need one of these sooner or later and uh, you can set the blade in for a push cut or a pull cut whichever you prefer the coping saw generally the blade is set for a pull cut and that is what I have this set in now but I'm probably going to switch it around and see how I like it as a push cut. But because I, that's the way I prefer most of my saws is in a push cut. But this will allow you to make circles and curves and things of that nature. You're going to end up needing one. Now, I have an Irwin from Lowe's. has a, a plastic rubberized kind of handle on it. And it's a fantastic coping saw. I just happen to like this old style with a wooden handle and stuff like that. Just like I like my old western saws. Okay, But these are the three types of saws that in my opinion you need as to the minutia of um, panel saw, uh, hand saw, um, Sash saw, tenon saw, carcass saw, coping saw, scroll saw, turning saw. That's up to you in the way that you work. But if you have a rip and a cross in a panel saw, a standard size back saw in 14 to 16 TPI filed rip and a coping saw those three saws or four actually will do 
anything you need pretty much in hand tool woodworking. And whether or not you want different variations of these types of saws is up to you and the way you work and what your wallet can handle and, and all of that. So that's my take and my opinion on the types of saws you need to do hand tool woodworking. Uh, but like I said, saws are one of the most controversial subjects on YouTube and in the hand tool world. I would say one other thing about saws. I choose western style saws because a western style saw I can resharpen for the rest of my life and never have to buy the saw again. Okay, It will be a lifetime tool I can count on. And that brings me to sharpening saws. In hand tool woodworking, and I'm going to do a video on this at some point, but sharpening, being able to sharpen your things, your tools, is the difference between whether or not you can do the work or not. And there's a huge amount of minutia involved in sharpening saws. But what I would tell you is to go to Paul Sellers YouTube channel and look up his saw sharpening playlist because you can get deep in the weeds of technical jargon when it comes to sharpening saws and things of that nature and setting saws and stuff like that. But you don't have to know all of that. You can get so deep into that that you can't figure out a way out of it. Paul has a way of separating all of that from the reality of what you have to do to sharpen your saw and he will show you what you need to know in order to sharpen your saw and keep woodworking and that's going to be the difference between him and a lot of the other people here on YouTube and it's why you'll hear me say Paul Sellers, Paul Sellers, Paul Sellers over and over again because he cuts through all the extraneous Hocus, and I'm not saying none of that information is valuable. I'm just saying for the average woodworker, what you need to know is how to make the saw work the way you want it to. Okay, he cuts through all of that and shows you what you need to know in order to work wood, in order to get your saw sharp, or your plane sharp, or your chisel sharp, or, or your gouge sharp, or your card scraper sharp, or or whatever it is you're sharpening. And so I recommend his videos highly. Okay. If you couple an understanding of the saws that you need and prefer with the knowledge to sharpen them and keep them sharp, the hand tool woodworking world is your oyster. Crack it open. Talk to you later.